God puts us in nations, in places, not by mistake, but to do a job. What if we opened our eyes to the needs of our colleagues, of our leaders, of our subordinates, and we were a priest on their behalf? Welcome to the Repurposing Business Podcast. My name is Brett Johnson. And I'm Len Johnson. And we're going to be talking about how to get our business into God's business. Our subtext is Let My Business Go, and we'll have guests from around the world. So thank you for joining us this week and every week on the Repurposing Business Podcast. Well, welcome to the Repurposing Business Podcast. My name is Brett Johnson, and I'm here with my good friend, Errol Smith, and we're in a month of miracles, but actually with Errol, I think it's been a lifetime of miracles, and certainly seems like I've known you for a lifetime, Errol. Uh, when was it that we first met? Do you remember? I remember it was 1996. I almost said 1896, but uh, we'll dispense with that one. <laughs> 1996, yeah, and uh, at that stage, we'd been living in California for about 10 years, and we were back in South Africa for a visit, and one of the things we'd been exploring, uh, we'd put together an organization to explore God and business, and uh, some of those things that we'd started back in South Africa in the early 1980s, as we mobilized our church leaders, mostly business people, to take up their responsibility in the kingdom of God. And I met Errol, and um, it wasn't love at first sight, not from my side, but Errol, I think you had, you had better ideas than me or something at that time. And you'd had a career, actually, in the Navy and had come out of the Navy, and then you were uh, doing your own consulting business. Uh, tell us about your, your early career and what you did in the military. Uh, gosh, I, I, I did a, I, I'm an inquisitive kind of a guy, and I, I always basically say, I'll try anything once. Uh, if it works, I may try it the second time. If it doesn't work, and I'm still alive, I'll, uh, I'll leave it. But uh, I, I landed up doing a lot of projects in the Navy, and uh, that sort of got me from one uh, exercise uh, to, to another, and uh, and I think it's like master systems plans of uh, computerization and so on like that was part of my portfolios. Um, there was an outfit uh, that we called uh, Naval Management Services, which I headed up, which did a lot of consulting inside the Navy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I headed that up for uh, five and a half years. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they wanted to promote me. And uh, I said to them, no, 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 no. I, I have found me uh, in this particular job and I want to stay. And, and that's not allowed within the military context. The senior officer needs to move every three years. Mm. I managed to stay there five and a half. Yeah. And then uh, I, they, they kept pushing. So I said to him, well, listen, I don't want to uh, go up the ranks and so on. Promote the other guys. I don't care because they're saying I was blocking other fellows being promoted. So uh, they they didn't like that either. So eventually they moved me to uh, a war college. Mm. And uh, I did research there for three years on uh, leadership development. Mm. And uh, I got bored with that as well. And eventually Penny said to me, listen, uh, resign. Yeah. So uh, I resigned. But uh, my boss got so angry with my letter uh, that he... I had a meeting with the chief of the Navy that evening at a function. And uh, the next, that was a Friday. Uh, the Monday, I got a signal from headquarters to say, early retirement approved. Wow. So, so wow. I got out of the Navy. Then uh, I took five months uh, leave that was still due to me. I took it yeah. and started my business. And then in 1997, I, I actually left after the... Uh, Mandela uh, Fleet Review, mm. uh, which I was called back. I was asked to stay on longer just to help with getting that uh, part of it organized at Naval Headquarters. Mm. And then after that, I was out uh, with my nothing future. <laughs> <laughs> but you had your talents. You had a good understanding of your talents and your skills. And, and you developed an expertise, I suppose you might call it in operational excellence and in helping organizations figure out how to actually make things work. Is that right? 
Yeah, because I, I did a lot of that within the Navy. Whenever they ever they had a, uh, a problem of sorts, uh, they would sort of uh, introduce me to it, and knowing that in chaos, chaos kills me, mm. or I kill the chaos. <laughs> uh, and so that's where I got a lot of my experience, and I, I was grateful for it because the Navy was good to me, mm. and I was good to the Navy. So it was a mutual, beneficial sort of relationship. Mm. And uh, I enjoyed my years in the Navy, although I, I went there reluctantly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, we do have a little bit of similarity in terms of pre-Navy background. Uh, you were working with Youth for Christ out in the Eastern Cape, some uh, back in your early years, right? Working, were you on the associate staff with them? or? Uh, I, I was, uh, I, I started off with, with them, actually with a, a project project. Uh, mm. There was Kenta Hoven, I don't know if you knew him. Uh, he was a guy, a South African, from, who came back from Britain mm. and ran projects, uh, citywide uh, outreaches and so on. Mm. And I was involved with uh, two of them, one in East London and one in Port Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. And it was there that we discovered that a lot of druggies mm. uh, came and got, got converted because we had a coffee shop. Uh, coffee bar sort of mm. meetings and so on like that mm -hmm. and uh, i started a drug rehabilitation center wow and uh after about uh, what was it 18 months to two years and so on like this it was getting a bit much for me on my own mm. so we closed that down and that's when i i joined uh youth for christ mm -hmm. on a sort of a probationary period yeah and uh yeah, ran, ran the situation in Port Elizabeth for, for some time. Fantastic, fantastic. Great. So back to the post-Navy. So you started consulting to companies in the broader Cape Town area, uh, building up your own consulting practice and um, primarily doing uh, improvement work of any kind. Is that right? You know, there, there was... Uh, a chief of the Navy, Admiral Syndicum, mm. uh, when he retired, uh, he called me to, uh, to to assist him because he was, uh, these guys work with uh, maritime kind of organizations. And so Master Matters, an organization, he asked me to, to do some strategic planning with them, mm. uh, the National Sea Rescue Institute uh, mm. with them and so on. And, and so I had a sort of a, a taste of consulting outside mm. uh, from those kinds of experiences. And then he insisted on paying me, mm -hmm. uh, which was a nice uh, extra. Mm -hmm. And so uh, from there, I, I kind of got a foothold on. But my first six months mm. uh, after I left the Navy, there was nothing. Mm -hmm. And I thought I'd made a mistake. And uh, it was only when I, I realized that uh, it was something that the Lord had sort of brought me into. Yeah. That uh, when I explained this to Penny one particular occasion, mm. and I said to her, I'm not sitting around just uh, watching TV all day and things like this. Yeah. I'm actually I was waiting on the Lord to, to show me what the future holds and so on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, she, she actually said to, to me, that's fine. I'm 100% behind you on this one. Mm. And it was in that particular moment that the phone rang. Mm. And uh, it was my first client. I mm. didn't know where they'd come from. I didn't mm. know who'd introduced them to me or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. That was my first client, and uh, it didn't stop from then. I've never advertised again, mm -hmm. and uh, I've never been without a job then, except when uh, yeah. COVID came in and killed uh, a lot yeah, of businesses. Yeah. Oh. yeah, 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 yeah. Fascinating, fascinating. So Errol, uh, we began the repurposing business program in Cape Town. Uh, back then we called it Equip in 2003. And you got involved uh, in this latter half of 2003, as I recall, or 2004, uh, quite heavily. And yeah. um, as is your gift, you find things that aren't running as optimally as they should be. And I remember you sitting down with Mike Bullock and myself and, and Mike, who's a British barrister, he's not the, doesn't claim to be the master of all things operational, although he does have good administrative gifts. Um, and uh, you said to Mike and I, you know, this this place could be run better. And we said, 
you've got a job, right? <laughs> uh, and and regrets all around ever since. Not right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, it's been a job that's been hard uh, for you to extricate yourself from because you got involved in Cape Town, and yeah. uh, as is our practice, we really encourage people to to do things in different nations and so on. And so I'd love to kind of pick up the threads. Uh, you fast forward and you find yourself on, on a trip to Indonesia. When was that? That was in uh, 19, uh, no, it was 2007. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the whole story was that I, I wasn't available to go to Indonesia at all. And uh, I, I kept uh, putting off uh, the uh, the setup and saying, "Listen, I can't uh, make it there like that." But Bob Norsworthy is not an easy guy to get rid of, <laughs> and uh, he he just uh, was convinced that I needed to go to Indonesia. So eventually, I went on a uh, venture to Indonesia, and uh, it was it was there that God just gave me a heart uh, for the nation and for the city and for the people. Mm. And uh, the, the last evening of the uh, venture, we, we actually went for a dinner, everybody. Yeah. And uh, I, I just uh, got a suspicion uh, regarding Bob and uh, Supano from uh, Jakarta. Mm. And uh, I, I sent a message to uh, Penny, my wife, and I they said, I think there's something coming here. Mm. Uh, and at the uh, session, I just looked at them across the table and said, listen, you guys are going to ask me something. What mm. is it? And uh, that's when they asked me if I would uh, come back and mm. uh, do some work there in Indonesia and uh, mm. on a sort of a, a semi-full-time basis. Yeah. And uh, that's that's when it uh, when it started. I came home, mm. uh, sorted things out here with with Penny and my children, who all agreed that this was what God wanted me to do. Mm. Uh, I got a bit of uh, interesting feedback from uh, the my church leadership, yeah. because I'm a married man uh, mm. and a family man. They said to me, "This is not the way to do it. Uh, this is this is wrong. You're a married man. You can't leave your wife behind." and and go off and so on like this and well eventually Penny and I we did, we agreed that this was what God wanted and uh, you know off I went mm -hmm. yeah yeah so this is the second time in the conversation that Penny says if you think that it's God I'm behind it and the two of you hearing God together and that's been a pattern I know for the two of you and uh, we're yeah, so and I, I'm a very obedient husband as well so uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're still married. And we're grateful to Penny because she's uh, must be one of the most low maintenance wives that there is on the planet. So absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. So Errol, um, you went to Jakarta, you were back and forth to South Africa for quite a number of years and uh, spent time working with the clients there that had been through repurposing business ventures. Eventually we ended up according to Sopano, with 81 clients who went through the REAP ventures there. And uh, you spent a good chunk of your years supporting those businesses over there. So what I'd like to do is to talk about just some of the highlights in terms of, we saw some miraculous things take place in Indonesia, as we do in all the nations that God takes us. And it'd be fun just to highlight some of those key stories of things that we can just a kick around about things that happened in Indonesia in those early years. Um, I should just say for those who are listening, it wasn't a, a walk in the park going to Indonesia. When we first went in there and uh, Bob and I were going in, we actually met with some resistance. Bob couldn't get into the country for a period. Uh, we had some opposition, and so all of the clients that we'd re recruited, all the consultants we'd trained, uh, they got ditched except for a few, and we had to start from scratch, and Sapana was a huge help with that process, and um, Julian Foe and some others. 
And so, yeah, it wasn't a walk in the park, but God did amazing things from the very first venture over there. And uh, as you reflect back on some of the businesses you worked with, Errol, what are some of the key things that come to your mind? Well, right, right in the beginning, uh, let, let, let's start with that sort of first miracle, other than the, the miracle of me being able to get there. Mm. Uh, I, I can't remember if it was two or three days after I was there, raw and uh, confused, unable to speak the language, uh, knew nobody, had no clue what I was doing there and why it was me. Uh, a guy walks into my office there and says to me, God said to me, I must give you some money. And I said to him, no, 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 please, just give it to the organization. I, I'm being looked after by uh, the institute and so on like that. Uh, pay the money to the institute and uh, they'll sort me out, sort of thing like that. He said to me, no, the Lord told me to pay you personally. So I said, but I have, he said, give me your bank details. So I said, I don't have any bank details. I've just arrived. Uh, <laughs> You know, I've, I've only got uh, my D by bank in South Africa. He says, no, the Lord told me to pay money to you in South Africa. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. Uh, okay, okay, all right. You know, I'm, I'm still confused and so on like this. So I just gave him my bank details and says, here my bank details. We didn't discuss money or anything like that. How much, when, how often, whatever the case may be. And I thought, well, okay, uh, he has a one one time donation coming through and so on like that. Bless you, kind of thing. Mm. And from then on, every single month for the three years I was there, the exact amount that I had arranged with Bob Norsworthy to be needed here in Cape Town for Penny to be able to carry on and pay bills, etc., like that, that was paid into my account every single month for those three years. Wow. Uh, and, and we'd never discussed how much it was the exact figure. Wow. Plus, of course, then the locals would, would pay a certain amount into my, uh, later my bank account when I got one, mm. uh, just to feed me on that side and pay for taxis and things like that. So, yeah. so that was medical, a uh, huge one in yeah. our thinking as well. So that's, that's the start of the whole thing. Must have been an encouragement to you and to Penny, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and of course, you know, we didn't know that it was going to be every month. <laughs> yeah. And so when that, that happened, you know, it was just the, uh, the sort of cherry on top to discover just how, how God works in yeah. situations okay. like that. Mm -hmm. Must bear in mind, too, that for some time, uh, I'd grown up in the sort of normal traditional church set up and so on where conservatively sort of say, well, you know, miracles today. Uh, okay, I had a cold and I prayed and the Lord healed me kind of thing. But, you know, that's the miracle. Yeah. And uh, I, I said to the Lord, uh, you know, one particular time, you said, uh, Jesus said that we would do what he did and more. Mm. I said, you know, healing a cold is not uh, the level that he was working at. What is going on? And he said, uh, there are miracles. And I said, but I don't see them. He said, because you're not looking. Mm. And when I started looking around at things that were happening to me and my family mm. and my friends, I recognized that there was daily miracles going on that we were saying, oh, it's a coincidence or, oh, it's this. And we always explained it away. Yeah. And it was when I started looking for those miracles that I started seeing things that I probably would not have been uh, aware of even today yeah so right. so when we when we started dealing with with clients i mean i remember the once uh we were uh, we had booked a venue for a uh, venture and uh there was no money to pay for the for the venue at that particular stage mm -hmm. and i had uh some of my folk that were assisting me at the venue and i was still at my accommodation and I was walking through the underground parking area. And I said to the Lord, you know, it would be great if when I got there, I could at least say something about the fact that don't worry, you know, the funds are there. Yeah. Uh, and so on. 
Mm. And I'd hardly said that when my phone rang. Mm. And it was a local businessman who said to me, the Lord told me I must give you some money. And I kind of heard that one before. Yeah. So I said to him, well, okay, you know, you know, here's the bank details, et cetera, et cetera. And the guy paid in a huge amount of money into that uh, account there and then. Yeah. So when I got to the venue, I was able to tell those that assisting me all sort of a little bit confused about, yeah, we're looking at the venue, but we've got nothing to pay uh, yeah. the for the venue. Uh, I could say to him, don't worry, the money's here, we can uh, we can go ahead, kind of thing. And that is in preparation for a venture in which you and the American folk, or Bob, really, mm -hmm. and the American uh, team were going to come. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there's just another miracle, mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yeah, wonderful, yeah. I remember on our first trip into Indonesia, I'd met a woman up in South Africa, Jessica Pile. she lives now in the Durban area, and... Um, uh, she was just interested. She'd not been through the repurposing business training. So I said to her, Jessica, look, come to Indonesia next week. I'm going to Indonesia next week. And I'd been speaking at an event in Johannesburg. And when I spoke, she was one of those people in the audience where her eyes just lit up. And her eyes lit up because God had spoken to her about doing work in the marketplace, working with businesses in the marketplace. She'd been to her church leaders and said, God's calling me to do ministry in the marketplace among these companies in the area where I'm working. And they said, no, God doesn't work like that. In fact, they said, you've got your ladder up the wrong wall. You need to actually do your ministry inside the church. So she was confused. For seven years, she was confused because God said this, the pastor said that, and she was left in no man's land or the desert. And so she came to Indonesia with us. The problem was we had way more clients than we had planned. It wasn't, you know, almost, you know how that story goes. The last day, all of a sudden, there's clients coming out. And I said to her, Jessica, you're going to have to pick up a client over here. This is what you're going to have to do. Now, she had a couple of degrees. She was a metallurgist, a mining engineer, and so on. And... Uh, and rumor developed that Jessica was an intercessor because Jessica spent the whole night praying for her client and so forth. But later I spoke to her and I said to her, Jessica, so you're an intercessor. She said, I'm not an intercessor. I was just dead scared. So I spent, <laughs> I spent the whole night praying. And what was fabulous with her client was, her client was folks who... Uh, we got to know well, Errol, you and I got to know well, Hariaman and Lani. And yeah. um, they had a similar story where they had come to know Christ. They had quite a big business uh, or two, but they put all of their focus uh, just on home groups. They were overseeing 30 home groups in a church, a wonderful church called Abelove. And, uh, but they let their business go down the tubes, as you recall. And, uh, and when Jessica was consulting with them and we talked about marketplace miracles, basically they were out of cash flow and Jessica prayed with them. And a few days later, they got a call from a client they hadn't heard from for years. The client was actually in South Africa, funnily enough. And um, the client ordered uh, garments because Lani was a fashion designer that was sitting in inventory. Now, typically garments sitting in inventory for 18 months are out of fashion. And she made some small modifications to them and sold all the backlog of, industry, uh, of inventory. And they had the cash flow they needed. And that miracle really turned Hariaman and Lani around, got their attention, showed them that God was interested in their business. And then we saw quite a few uh, subsequent stories with that couple, as you recall. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. Uh, it, it was. Uh, it's. It's just one of those weird things that uh, you know we are sometimes so uh, unaware of just how much work God is doing in the background uh, yeah. all the time, and uh, it's it's that kind of thing that uh, I, I saw over there, and and it strengthened my understanding of this whole concept of miracles and so on like this, mm. and uh, it started making me. Uh, more acceptable for the fact that uh, God is in the medical business. Yeah. And uh, one one of the issues, and I mean, 
uh, pe people laugh at me, but uh, I, I get to uh, this this guy that that paid the money into my account, also a South African guy. Uh, you remember him, come for certain day, mm. uh, who was working there at the, at the time, and uh, then he and his family came back to South Africa, but he still had to do work there, yeah. and so he would pop in. Uh, for a couple of uh, days a week or, or two and so on like this. And then he came and he stayed with me in my apartment. Mm -hmm. And I put a mattress down in the corner of my small apartment because it had one bedroom and so on. And uh, we were sitting there chatting. Now, you know, the, the temperature uh, and the uh, absolute uh, heat issue there in Indonesia doesn't change from day to night. It stays around about 35 degrees. Right. And uh, windows are that's, that's not Fahrenheit, right? That's that's Celsius. That's Celsius. With humidity. With humidity and so on. And while we were talking there, uh, the air con in that sort of uh, section where he was spending the night died. Hmm. And I sort of said, oops, what are we going to do now kind of thing? So... Uh, I, was, I was thinking some sort of kind of sel selfish thoughts and so on. Well, my aircon in my bedroom is fine. Uh, tough on this guy. He's going to have to weather the, the storm, as it were. And I thought, oh, well, maybe I could be kind and leave my door open and look at some of the effect, effect of the uh, yeah. aircon. And then the Lord said to me, pray for the aircon. Yeah. Uh, hang on, hang on. <laughs> I don't do that kind of thing. And the Lord just uh, basically looked at me mm. like Penny does sometimes and said, listen, pray for the aircon. Mm. Uh, so I said to come for sorry. I'm just being inter interrupting our conversation now, but the Lord is telling me to pray for the aircon. Yeah. So I went there and I reached up to the aircon with my hand and so on like this, put my hand on the aircon and I prayed for it. Mm. And I finished and I said, well, okay, now it's not working. And the Lord said to me, well, switch it on. And now comes the moment of uh, true confessions. If I switched it on and it didn't work, what then? Yeah. Uh, if I switched it on and it worked, well, <laughs> what then, sort of thing? Anyway, I threw the switch and the aircon came on. Mm. And it worked. Mm. The next morning, the aircon died again. Yeah. Now, the previous night, I couldn't phone the uh, uh, folk downstairs and say, listen, come and sort out the aircon. But in the morning, I could because everybody was at work. Yeah. yeah. So they sent up a technician mm. and uh, he fiddled around with the thing and he uh, took something out and he put something in. And the next thing he said, OK, there it works. So I said to him, hold on. What was it that went wrong? Mm. What stopped the thing from working? And he showed me a little uh, gadget, yeah. uh, which I've got here today still. Yeah. I don't know if you can see this little yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was the thing that had died. Yeah. Uh, I, I took it to him and I said to him, can this thing die and get fixed again and then die again? And he said to me, and he's broken again. No, no, so we broke it, broke. Uh, <laughs> So I said to him, give me that piece. Yeah. Because I don't like it when people talk about these fri frivolous sort of uh, medical ideas and things like this. I like the concrete ones and the proof of it. Mm -hmm. And I still have this thing on my desk today after yeah. all these years uh, as a reminder. Yeah. I, very much like the Israelites uh, when God told them to pack up those stones and so on like that as a reminder yeah. of what God has done. Yeah, uh, I, I keep this kind of thing as a reminder yeah. of, of the thing and so on. So, you know, that's that's the kind of uh, thing that happens in everyday life. Yeah, uh, which which we ignore and so on. And I know I'm talking about things that are not specific to the customers and or the clients in Indonesia, but I got used to the kind of idea that God can do anything with anything. Right. Because when you were there, the ones, and you were doing the, uh, the, the, the financial, what did you call that financial ministry thing initially, that presentation that you made in Bandung? Kingdom economics, yeah. 
You you ran the Kingdom Economics uh, session in Bandung. Yeah. And then we had a number of clients sitting around as we usually do at tables and so on like this. And I had my laptop and so on, and uh, I was working on it. And next thing, I lost internet connection. Yeah. So I looked around at the shop, uh, American young folk that were there. And I thought, now who can I ask to, to fix it? And everyone was involved with their client. And I thought, I can't do that. Yeah. So the Lord said to me, pray for your laptop. Mm. And I sighed inside. I said, oh, no, no, I don't do that kind of thing. <laughs> so the Lord said to me, pray for your laptop. So I surreptitiously looked around to see if anybody was looking. And I closed the, the lid of the laptop mm. and I put my hand on it and I still looked around to see if anybody was going to see me. Yeah. And I prayed for the laptop because I was embarrassed. What's going to happen? Yeah, I'm mm. praying for the laptop in what I think is obedience to the Lord and nothing's going to happen. Yeah. Anyway, I clicked the buttons and so on. Like this, boops, everything was there and I was fine. Mm. The laptop yeah. was working. Yeah. And in fact, that, that laptop only last year my son got rid of that laptop because it is now so old. Uh, yeah. You know, it's, it's that kind of thing, practical, ordinary day things. Fantastic, yeah. But to get back to your issue about the uh, Indonesian uh, clients and so on, like that, mm. we had so many uh, that I, I started making a list of what it was that various folk were doing and so on. And, and you will remember that uh, there was the time that you wanted to go to, uh, uh, what was that uh, one uh, outfit in, I think it was also in Bandung or somewhere in Jakarta. Mm. No, it was in Jakarta. Yeah. That, uh, what was that company that was, uh, that huge company that we did the Lemon Leadership for? Smart Narco was their name. Smart yeah. Narco, that's yeah. the one. <laughs> now, Dina uh, was at the venture with us and we were going the next day to go to Swart Naka and you wanted to do this lemon leadership uh, setup yeah. and uh, to do it all nice and fancy uh, as per usual, yeah. she was asked to do a whole lot of uh, printing, color printing right. on the one printer that we had. And uh, she did all the printing, etc. And uh, I, I said to her, I said, you know, this, this thing is, I, I've not got ink for this thing. Mm. So whatever is there is, is all the ease kind of thing. And uh, so she finished the printing mm. and had everything nicely done. And uh, I was praying actually all the time to sort of say, Lord, like that oil story, just make this ink. Mm. Keep going until the job is done. Yeah. Which happened. Yeah. Uh, but you know, that's easy to say to people, oh, okay, well, there was enough in, in, anyway. Yeah. Anyway, the next morning she came and she said, oh, just wanted to do a couple of extra ones mm. uh, just, just in case. Mm. Well, the moment she started printing, the printing ink died. <laughs> and I actually have a copy of the actual page. Yeah. I, because I printed it. Yeah. And I then wrote the story underneath of exactly what happened. Yeah. yeah. And in spite of the fact that the ink uh, had died, she was able to print mm. a couple of uh, items that was necessary for that day's activities. And that ended up, after she'd uh, finished that morning, uh, this particular thing showed up. Yeah. Yeah. Dry and dry as could be. Yeah. And that was not a small exercise. We had about 125 participants. It was not a, a, a few pages to print. It was a big deal. So that's amazing. Now, we decided Errol had a brilliant idea after we'd been uh, sweating and, and working hard, coming up with a fresh purpose, doing Lemon Leadership with this whole corporate office for this company. Uh, Errol's idea of relaxing was to go whitewater rafting on the weekend. But uh, I think Dina and I managed to persuade you that that going and lying around on a nearby island would be a much better idea. And uh, so we ended up 
going to a little island, I think it was called Palua Aya, and quite close to Jakarta, we went across on a boat, but we weren't just lying around. We took a, a group of the local uh, business leaders to actually talk with them about how they could themselves be facilitating transformation in businesses using the 10P model and other principles we taught them. And that was quite a miraculous weekend, wasn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I don't think any of us uh, imagined what was going to happen, but uh, with the local folk, uh, a lot of the issue and the challenges that you'd put out uh, to them was, guys, where's your wife in your business? Yeah. Uh, what role does she play? Yeah. And each of them had been talking about the fact that, uh, you know, they, they're just uh, another employee kind of thing. Yeah. And some of them are, 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 are sometimes not even that, you know, they, they just sort of uh, help the husband uh, and then fade out of the thing, but the boss is the husband and he gets on with the job sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And it was there that when they uh, said that, that you started the challenge to them about, uh, guys, uh, what role does your wife play in the kingdom yeah. and in your business? And uh, it was there that the couple started, uh, the men started apologizing to their wives for having uh, sort of side, uh, well, put, put them aside as it were, as, as, mm. as an extra or a help when they were needed and so on like this, but uh, yeah. not fully involved in the business. Yeah. And uh, there, were, there were many, many, many tears of, uh, repentance and tears of joy yeah. as uh, as they sort of each one uh, of the guys that were there that were considered to be part of this sort of internal local leadership uh, setup mm -hmm. and uh, they were blown out of their minds with, with what the Lord was doing to them yeah. and then yeah. Hariyaman arrived uh, before, we go to, before we go to Hariyaman I just want to oh, okay. Do you remember? So we went through couple after couple, and, and of course we prayed for the first couple who worked this through. It took a few hours to, to, and then they prayed for the next couple, prayed for the next couple. Hariaman wasn't there yet. But that evening, you and Dina and I went to dinner. We got to the dinner place before the other people happened. Do you remember what happened when the people walked in that evening for dinner? No. Yeah, so what happened was we looked, and it was as if, these wives oh, yes. that had facelifts, right? They That's looked right. like they were 10 years younger. It was, we talk about the glory of God. God's the glory, my glory and the lifter of my head and what God does to our countenance, does to appearance. It was, I mean, these women looked like they were the wives 10 years younger, like something had right. dropped off them and they were youthful. You recall that? Absolutely, yes. I remember uh, I, I said to the one, but, but you... Your, your face is so shiny. You look so uh, radiant. And uh, initially, we didn't quite work out what, what was going on. And then we realized when we saw the others, uh, this was God had just sort of lifted the uh, spirits and, and things like this. And, you know, they, they had this youthful look about them, which uh, had, had not been there before. But, you know, they had that sort of tired, weary look. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Although they were all pretty uh, women, yeah. Uh, it yeah. was just this uh, whole look that had changed. It was quite amazing. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, uh, particularly uh, Gimon's wife. Mm. I, I remember she she had quite a story uh, in in the relationship set up and so on like that uh, with with him, and yeah. Uh, yeah. she she was uh, overwhelmed. Yeah. By, by just yeah. what God had uh, done there, mm -hmm. and then, uh, then of course, Hariyaman arrived, and uh, totally oblivious to what had happened, <laughs> but fell into the into the hole that had been dug for him in this whole relationship set. <laughs> yeah, and the same thing happened to him, and uh, of course, I forget his wife's name now Lani. again. Lani, Lani, mm -hmm. Lani yeah. Uh, it uh, because she she wanted to to also deal with the issue on on that basis and so he wasn't allowed to escape mm. uh, the exercise yeah. and so uh, the amazing thing to uh, me and I think to you as well was when we went back uh, mm. 
to Jakarta, there was a function that was arranged uh, and they wanted to do, they had arranged it and they wanted to just uh, share with the others what had happened on the island. Yeah. And uh, that too, to me, was an amazing yeah. uh, ex experience of, of just how much God has been doing in people's lives around this whole issue. Mm. Yeah. No, that's right. Yeah. It was amazing, amazing time. And Errol, thanks for your many years investing in Indonesia. Let's flip into South Africa. So you came back and, of course, uh, you didn't come back to retirement over here. We had some ongoing reap ventures and there were many that you were involved in. Um, and, uh, and in a more recent one, I believe it was in 2012, you and Linda Wajaya at the time, now Linda Sita, were because uh, uh, Gareth and Linda, who were both staff members at the Institute, married each other. And uh, you and Linda were consulting to a company out of the Paul, uh, just about 50 miles or so outside of Cape Town. Hannes and Unra came along to the venture. Tell us a little bit about uh, Hannes and Unra's. Uh, what business were they in and what was going on? Uh, yeah, the business that in <clears throat> is the actual, uh, Hannes' name reversed, called mm -hmm. Senna. <clears throat> uh, Senna. Uh, systems and so on. <clears throat> and they they were there trying to sort of uh, also find out what uh, how, how to move forward. Uh, <clears throat> I think Danny DeWitt uh, had, had uh, introduced him to uh, Reap and so on. I'm not quite sure just how that happened. But as their uh, consultants, we were dealing with them and uh, they they make uh, packing uh, machines for farmers, right? And uh, the the initial machine was packing potatoes into bags of a certain weight mm. and size and so on like this. And uh, they had a, a number of uh, about five hundred or so machines around the country already established, etc. Uh, but they they were there. And so we were sharing with them and just uh, the, the usual 10p principles and so on and how to do that a lot. And <clears throat> there was a uh, two or three folk, as we normally have, intercessors in a different room praying yeah. uh, for uh, each of the companies and each of the clients and the consultants and so on. And I think it was Dina that came up and handed uh, Hannes a piece of paper yeah and uh, on the piece of paper <clears throat> it said something about uh, you're in the flying business some some wording yeah going to flying and, and things like this well he was shocked well so was I uh, because we hadn't talked about that at all and he'd not ever said anything to me about flying and so on like this but he then uh, in absolute amazement, uh, said, you know, that I have always anchored after being a pilot. Uh, he got to the Air Force for his national service, but he didn't fly or anything like this. He was relegated to some other work, as was I. Uh, and, and so this, this whole thing, and, and he shared it with uh, his wife, Anna, on, on the setup and said, you know, this is what's happening. And it was a boyhood dream of his to fly. And here comes this message, and he'd not told anybody, uh, other than obviously his wife and so on. And here comes this message to say, you know, there's, there's something about uh, aircraft flying and so on like that in your future. Well, subsequent to that, he's got his pilot's license. Uh, he and Danny DeWitt, who was one of our local South African clients at some one point, uh, bought an aircraft together. And uh, in, in fact, I think it was last week again, he said to me, Danny's asked me to go flying with, with him and so on. Uh, and and that's, that's what uh, he kind of moved into. Mm. But because his business was having uh, problems and so on like this, he stopped uh, flying because it's an expensive uh, issue. But the idea of flying from Paul to uh, 
a client, a farmer who has a, a landing strip and so on like this, of course, is a huge uh, yeah. time saver and a, and a plus factor for his business. Uh, so that's the way he's, he's looking at the whole thing. Mm. But uh, I've been with, with them ever since. I go there once a week. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, we just pray together and we, we, we see God's face as to what's, what's happening. Right. Now, they had some challenges during COVID, right, and, and with their business. And, and uh, what was the upshot of that? I believe they got to a point where they were advised to shut the business down. What, what transpired? This was actually before COVID. <clears throat> uh, they, were, they were told by the phone, because they, they'd had some good years up to about uh, 2015, I think it was. And then the thing just started tanking. And uh, it was then that uh, for some crazy reason, I, I understand now it was the Lord, <clears throat> uh, I, I phoned them uh, because I hadn't heard from them since the, the venture and, and so on, and since my return from Indonesia. And so I just phoned them and said, how are things going? Uh, and can I come and have a chat? And I thought, well, I'll just go and pray for them as I would then do for other uh, clients that had been with us before. And in his office, <clears throat> uh, he was sitting in his, in his, uh, the boss's chair. And uh, they were telling me this the story that uh, they, they were in, in deep trouble because they were financially in debt and so on. And uh, business wasn't uh, up and running and so on. And they were down to, I think, three or four uh, staff members. Uh, the others had, had moved off out of uh, fear of being left without a job and so on. And I said to Manus, I will come and, come and consult uh, for you and, and, and work with you through this whole process. Uh, and he looked at me and I said, but this will be pro bono because I know you don't have the money. Well, the man eyes just filled with tears and a big stepping Afrikaner guy sitting there crying uh, in your presence isn't an easy thing <laughs> to, to handle. <clears throat> but I then started uh, once a week uh, just visiting them and praying with them and, and so on and seeking the Lord's face. And the financial guys that they had been involved with, uh, said to them, guys, your business is bankrupt. You need to close it down. I said to them, is that what God says? <clears throat> because I remember Brett Johnson says, business is only dead when God declares it dead. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> so I used those words and said to them, listen, guys, is this business dead in God's economy or is it just the natural uh, human reaction to the fact that the finances are in such a bad shape? <clears throat> so I said to him, listen, you need to, I, I can't tell you because I'm outside of the business. You have to face the music. So you need to determine before the Lord whether this is the fact or not. Yeah. And the two of them went away for the weekend. And after the weekend, they came back and said, no, the Lord has not told them to close the business. <clears throat> they reckon the Lord says the business must continue. Yeah. Well, it has continued from then on. Mm. And they're still not out of the woods. Uh, yeah. In fact, there are still lots of challenges and so on. But they, <laughs> they're getting used to They haven't quite got used to the fact that God provides even though it's a day or two before the end of the month and you've got no money in your account. Right. And then it happens every single month. Mm. They're able to deal with the needs around them as carefully as they can, but still deal with it. And I remind them of the story of the client in Indonesia, <clears throat> the one that on the Monday after we dealt with who owns your business and the purpose of the business and so on like that, uh, you will remember his name. I don't. Mm. But 
he came back the next morning and he said, my wife and I last night, we agreed the business belongs to God. And so the next morning he went into his office and he didn't sit in his usual chair, in the boss's chair. He sat on the opposite side. Mm. And he talked to Jesus as Jesus was in his chair. Yeah. And on the basis of that, in praying with, uh, and, and talking to the Lord, uh, he then got up mm. and was going to go out mm. to, do, to do his marketing, whatever it was that he was doing. Mm. And his wife said to him, but hang on, do you know that today, by 12 o'clock, we must pay our suppliers 12,000 US dollars, and we don't have that money. There's no money in the bank. Hmm. He said, yes, I know. She so said, well, what are you going to do? He said, no, you talk to the CEO. <laughs> yeah. As he was walking out, his two accounts ladies said to him, but sir, we, we need to pay these bills. And there's no money in the account. He said, yes, I know. He said, well, what must we do? He said, talk to the CEO. And he mm. walked out. Mm. And around about 12 o'clock that day, he got a call from his wife. Mm. And she was a bit uh, uptight about the whole issue. And she said to him, where's the money come from? Mm. He said, what money? She said, there's 12,000 uh, US dollars in our account. Mm. He said, talk to the CEO. <laughs> <laughs> And, yeah. and that's how I got. And so I told Hannes and them the story. Mm. You know that to this day, Hannes doesn't sit in the CEO's chair. Yeah. When yeah. we're there, we sit around the table, mm. but not that chair. That chair is left empty mm. because that's God's chair. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, he, he works on that basis. Mm. So uh, that's how it goes from month to month to month. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it's an absolute thrill to me the way the Lord has grown these two people mm. and the business, because now they they have, what is it, 12 people, staff working, mm. and God brings them in incredible ways yeah. from way up north of uh, South Africa in different uh, cities and so on like this. These are people that are qualified to do the work that they do, but they yeah. haven't got jobs, and then they end up uh, in power. Yeah. And, Others that uh, the Lord then takes out mm. of the company. And uh, I said to him just the other day, I said, you now have the basis of what God has put in place to be able to grow the business for the future. Yeah. So hang in there. Mm. And that's what they do. And I, I'm so blessed by the two of them as they uh, go from month to month, mm. uh, struggling with their own thoughts and their own minds and how they yeah. cope with these things, but yeah. they do. Yeah. And uh, and that's that to me is, is a blessing to me and a challenge to me. Yeah. Errol, I love the, the point, and we've seen quite a few people come to that realization, but that symbolic thing of the chair is, I think the usual Christian in business is, God bless my business. I'm doing this business for you, so bless the business. But Absolutely. people like Hannes and Andre have realized this is not actually my business anymore. And I yeah. think this is the, when people go through the repurposing business process is a fundamental, whose business is it? And is this business deployed for God's purposes, not just is God blessing the business? And I think it's a, it's a fundamental shift um, with the companies. And so it's wonderful to see that. And then the other thing I would say is just to affirm, you know, many of us want a miracle. I mean, we live in a place where we need miracles. And uh, and sometimes you might say, well, in the promised land, you, you don't need miracles every day. And I understand that. But the we don't want to be in a place where we need a miracle. In other words, it, it, it's this strange kind of tension. And we don't want to end up in a place where we need miracles just because of our own stupidity and so on. But the life of business is a life of faith. And God actually, God actually uses the miracles to market. I was chatting with Danny DeWitt last week and uh, asking him because God's done some miracles in their business as well. And uh, But one of the outcomes of that is when the staff have seen it, 
a number of the staff have become believers because they've said, okay, this is out of the ordinary. This is, you can't explain this based on human effort or logic or just a little bit of prayer and salt and pepper. Absolutely. And, and uh, this, is, <clears throat> this is what thrills me so because I've taken that uh, company uh, away for a team build. Mm. And I am absolutely amazed at what God has done in the individual staff members' lives. Uh, some of them are not uh, born again Christians, but through the influence and the uh, the things that happen mm. within the company, they are able to see that God is busy, and uh, Hannes and Anra walk in faith. Though it's a it's a struggle sometimes, and they and they and they they're sweating. Mm. Uh, they they walk in this faith, and the other guys see it, and they respond accordingly. Right. And those those that are living with their girlfriends marry. Mm. Those that are smoking stop. Mm. Uh, those that are outside of the sort of uh, the kind of things that one uh, associates with. You know, a decent life and so on like this. All these things are happening in their lives, mm. and uh, it, it it just is a thrill. I said to him, I have never worked with a team that has blessed me so mm. much as this group of folk. As I see them interacting with each other mm. and sorting out things and the way they work together, and uh, I mean, now you're sitting with traditional sort of Africana environment mm. of, of folk and so on. And then there is a, a Zimbabwean fella mm. and there's a, a Congolese fella. Mm. And there is no issue with these guys at all. Mm. Uh, they, 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 the amazing thing was the one fella had seen his and been right there when his friend had drowned. Mm. And so he was dead scared of the water. Mm. And when we were at one of the uh, a previous uh, team build, when we had a break for the afternoon to sort of say, well, okay, just go and relax and whatever. The white guys, now we're talking racial issues here now, mm. but the white guys got this black guy into a canoe where he and the other guy went canoeing while they were in other canoes around them, mm. just to get this guy to a point where he was not as scared of the water as he had yeah. been before. Yeah. And this was a team building the team, mm. uh, which was such a blessing to me. And I said yeah. to him, wow, you know, yeah. this, this is amazing mm. to, to look at folk and, and to uh, <clears throat> have folks supporting each other in such a way that there is no discrimination there's no uh, uh, drama between them and so on like this. And when there is something that they disagree with, they sit down and they talk it through and they pray it through and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's quite amazing to me. Yeah. But it's because we don't want miracles. It's because we're unfamiliar with it and we're scared of it. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I've, I've got to a point now where I expect miracles daily. I mean, the fact that I'm awake today Mm -hmm. And uh, that to me is a miracle in itself. Um, well, let's just unpack that a little bit, Errol, because you are a bit of a walking miracle, aren't you? So in the last three or four years, you've been on a bit of a journey. And I know that I have to ambush you with this because you won't talk about yourself. But now that I've got you um, and you can't run away, I suppose you could hang up, but don't. Tell us a little bit of your, tell us a little bit. I mean, you are a bit of a walking mir miracle. What's happened in your life? Uh, okay, uh, it, it is a long story. Let me try and uh, uh, cut it down a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> we've we've had a, a, a number of dramas in in the family with uh, <clears throat> my sister-in-law getting cancer, my brother-in-law having a stroke, my mother-in-law uh, passing away, uh, my daughter having uh, breast cancer. Uh, I, some years back, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. <clears throat> and so uh, that, that was an issue. 
Uh, but, you know, you kind of work your way through it and so on like this. And my doctor said to me, listen, you will die with cancer. You won't die from cancer. Mm -hmm. oh, well, thanks very much. But anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I'll live with that. Uh, <clears throat> then in 2020, uh, gosh, time flies. Uh, <clears throat> I was diagnosed with uh, stomach cancer, and it turned out to be uh, stage four uh, terminal and so on. And uh, I said, well, okay, that's a different story sort of thing. How do I deal with this? And the, the Lord kept saying to me, but listen, uh, <clears throat> I've, I've got to, to, to voice the, the, the little saying that I'm immortal until my job is done. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I kind of got that uh, from, from the Lord in the sense that uh, he's in control. Uh, <clears throat> this is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I need to do what is right with this. But it's his, if he wants to take me now, then he must take me. I've had a good life. Uh, and on, on the basis of that, I, I kind of just got to the point of saying, well, okay, uh, I'm, I'm good until uh, my job is done. That's why it's interesting that uh, every now and again, I want to make sure that I have got a job to, <laughs> that has to be done. <clears throat> Uh, because both Penny and I have agreed that if it's something that the Lord wants me to bear with and <clears throat> keep me for a long period until my job is done, that's fine. But if I'm just going to sit around and mope and uh, <clears throat> watch TV and things like this and wait for the end, <clears throat> then we both agree I might as well go now. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm... I'm wasting energy yeah, and uh, food money and things like that. <clears throat> so on the basis of that, I've just got to the point where it's no big deal. Now, now people think I'm a mad hero when I say, listen, it, it doesn't hassle me. I mean, even my family battle to understand the fact that I'm not uh, hassling or struggling with this idea. Mm -hmm. I've just accepted the fact that this is uh, the way the Lord wants me to go. Yeah. And... I need to be able just to do what is done, what needs to be done. And uh, that's why I've, I've backed up on the chemotherapy and things like that, because it was knocking me uh, silly for two weeks and then I'm okay for a week. And then it starts all over again. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just felt that I, I needed to be able to do what the Lord wants me to do daily. Yeah. Uh, I can't sort of hive off for two weeks and uh, feel sick. And so that's the basis that I've worked on. And, and I've, I've come to terms with that. My family's come to terms with that and set up and so. Mm -hmm. But in that little lot, when my son was told that I've got this uh, terminal cancer, uh, of course, he was terribly upset. He's living in the UK, working there. And uh, we thought, well, okay, now, you know, we don't know how long it's going to be sort of thing, let him come and we can just talk and then he can see and, and relate to me that uh, it's, it's not such a foreign long distance issue and so on like that. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> the Thursday, he was going to fly and <clears throat> we put it off, <clears throat> excuse me, we put it off and sort of said, well, okay, you'll buy his ticket on the Monday because it's too late now because this was by the Friday. Uh, it did come to terms with the fact that uh, you now he's going to fly. Uh, but we leave it and it'll buy his ticket on the, on the Monday because we're working through a South African uh, agency here as well. The Monday lockdown, hmm. and he wasn't allowed to come uh, through and so on like that. And we were terribly disappointed on that. His ticket was paid for, everything was done and so on like this, and he wasn't able to come. Mm. But that has persisted for goodness knows how long, until November this year. Mm. Sorry, last year, November hasn't come yet. Last year, mm. suddenly things opened up, and he was told on the, again, on the one day, uh, he was going to come, 
and then they'd lock down again. Mm. And he'd actually, that was the uh, the Friday, the, the Saturday, he'd unpacked all the stuff again because he was fed up with this whole story. Now he can't come again like this. The Monday, it opened up. Mm. And he then booked his seat and so on. And then he spent two and a half months here because his company said he could work from home there while he can work from home here as well. Yeah. So he's been here for two and a half months. He went back last week, Wednesday. Mm. And uh, the miracle in that was that we wanted him here originally. Mm. But then he would have seen me in my sixth state because of the chemo and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And uh, it's not a happy thing for a person to watch somebody being so sick. Yeah. And so uh, we felt that it would have been a traumatic time for him. Mm. Whereas now, Having come when he came, we were able to snorkel together, dive together. Uh, we were able to go hiking together. We've been able to do all kinds of memory things mm. that are precious in a relationship because he and I are very close. Mm. And uh, in spite of the distance and so on. And on the basis of that, we now realize, looking at hindsight, that that has been the miracle that God kept him away during the time when it would have been a very traumatic experience for him, mm. the time when we, the two of us have got such lovely memories. Mm. Uh, we've been on park runs together. Uh, he and I insists that I continue while he continues on that side to do park runs, just to get this thing fitness and so on like this, to the point where the doctors tell me, look, you don't look sick. Yeah, right. I say, well, I'm not sick until you tell me I'm sick. <laughs> so uh, stop telling me. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's a short part of the of the story mm. and so on like this. And I and I'm blessed because there have been numbers of folk praying for me. Mm. But one of the things that I said to folk, listen, if you want to pray for my healing, which is what most folk want to do, and they're concerned and they uh, you know they, they they want to do the right thing. I said to him, listen, remember Jesus when he was in the garden. He said, please, if it's possible, take this away from me. Mm. But not my will, but your will be done. Yeah. And I said, pray that prayer for me. Yeah. Because if you don't pray that last part, it, <clears throat> what happened if Jesus had got his will, his way that night, mm. and he had not gone to the cross? Mm. Where would you and I be today? Yeah. So when you pray, pray first to the Lord and ask him what you need to pray for for me. And yeah. if it is healing, then I'm fine with that. But don't just pray that because that's the done thing. You know, we must pray for this guy because he's sick and all this kind yeah. of business. Mm. <clears throat> so that's that's where I am at the moment. Yeah. Now, yeah. subsequent to that, I've had another cancer outbreak, mm. but that was in my leg. Mm. And uh, it's been cut out and so on like that. And the, mm. the thing has proved to be cancerous and so on. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so <laughs> the walking vertical, well, maybe that's it. That's it, yeah. Well, Errol, for my part, <clears throat> I might not be the best prayer, but I will keep you busy because it uh, seems like you said to God that he shouldn't take you until your job is done. Well, I'll make sure you've got plenty of jobs. <laughs> and, uh, you might be older than Methuselah if you're not careful, you know. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, that's fantastic. Well, Errol, thank you so much for taking the time to share your story and your journey. And um, you don't know this, but a couple of years ago, my kids gave me a, a one of these gifts that keeps on giving. It's a company called StoryWorth. And every week they email you a question and you have to answer the question. And then at the end of the year, you can compile a book of you know stories, things that the kids might not have known about your life and so on. So that kept me busy every Sunday through COVID mostly. And I um, recorded 48 or so of these stories. And uh, one of the questions was, who are your heroes? Who do you look up to? And I thought, you know, people will talk about Nelson Mandela or the guy who went to the moon or somebody who invented a cure for this or that. And for me, uh, in my story was my heroes are the lesser known people who are actually getting on doing what God wants them to do. And uh, people like yourself and Francois Stein and the Comfort Serpentines who you mentioned, and others who are out there. So Errol, um, 
you are one of my heroes and I am uh, privileged to know you and uh, grateful for the stance that you and Penny take, uh, which is, okay, God, what do you want us to do, even if it looks stupid or unorthodox, um, and the selfless way that you get on serving the people that, that you've identified that God puts in front of you. And um, when we ask for volunteers for something, whether it's repurposing business training to, le to lead that or to do transforming society or go on a venture or do a trip or go to India or go to Indonesia or the US or whatever, then um, your default position is I'm available and I'm willing and uh, not the other way around. So for many people, uh, good Christian people, their default is I'm not going until God whacks me on the side of the head. And yours is the opposite, which is I'm all set to go unless God says no. And I love that about you and Penny, and uh, certainly it's been an inspiration to many. So Errol, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for taking the time to share your story and just the amazing stuff that God's done in and through you and that we've had the privilege of observing around the world. Can I just add uh, two other issues? One is that uh, when, when there's a, a call on, on me to, to do something, and I check with Penny because... Uh, Isaac and I have got that sort of uh, relationship, particularly with our wives. I don't know about other folk. Uh, that if the wife says no, it's no until the wife has been convinced that it's yes. Yeah. Excuse me. And we'd say to the Lord, well, if, if she feels no, then you need to tell her what you've told me. And when we both agree, then, uh, then it's a go. Right. Now, on the basis of that, when I say to Penny, listen, I've got a weekend men's uh, thing, uh, camp or something like this that the guys want me at, uh, can I go? And she says, go. And I say, listen, are you trying to get rid of me? <laughs> because every time something like this comes up, you say, go. Uh, <laughs> but she's in total support of that kind of thing. But the issue is really that it's a relationship thing. Right. But getting back to this miracle story, yeah, I want to challenge people there to look at what happens to them each day and try to identify the miracles that are taking place in their own lives, not necessarily in somebody else's life. Right. Because we always believe miracles for other people, but for ourselves, we don't. Now, it's going to be weird in some cases. For instance, <clears throat> I have a New Testament uh, number of CDs that I have uh, in my car yeah. that when uh, I, I've, I need to, then I want to, then I just uh, listen to that. And then I enter the, uh, spurs that with a couple of Christian songs and so on. Hmm. And at one particular point, my CD wouldn't work. I, I couldn't get the stuff in. And... Uh, I, I battled for, for quite some time, and then I went to a, a place that works with uh, radios and so on like that in cars and so on, and the guy said to me, sorry, that's what happens uh, to CDs after a while. Uh, you need to determine this one guy that will maybe fix it for you, or we will need to replace it. And I said, well, give me a ballpark figure. Well, between three and 6,000 grand. Uh, for this little lot. So I said, yeah, I don't have that kind of money. Right. So I, I just accepted the fact that uh, it's not going to be an issue. Right. And then the Lord reminded me. He said, you pray for an aircon, you pray for a laptop, how about praying for your uh, CD player? Yeah. You know, uh, sort of uh, type on another game, you know, sort of thing like this. Okay, Lord. And I prayed for the thing. You know, it hasn't been a problem ever since. And this is now a few months. And the issue is that the Lord is going to ask you to pray for a, a thing that looks rather stupid or simple. But if you do it in obedience, he loves it. He loves that act of obedience response that we give him. Because then it's almost like a, a, a dual uh, sort of excitement yeah. between you and him to actually see this thing happen and say, you see, that's my father. Yeah. Uh, that's the kind of father I have. He, he doesn't mess around.
Mm. So uh, I, I challenge folk to do that and uh, make that an issue. Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, it, it, it is, is something. Because uh, if you don't, then you miss out so much. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's part of the relationship building between uh, the Lord and I is, yeah. is to come to terms with these uh, everyday things that are actually mm. miracles. Yeah. But we sort of write them off as uh, coincidental. Ah, well, you know, something else happened. And yeah. you know, yeah. maybe I bumped a thing uh, differently and it works now yeah. sort of thing. You know, that kind of nonsense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Well, uh, Errol, thank you so much. That's a great way to end. I appreciate it. And um, God bless you. God bless you and Penny and your household. And thank you so much for sharing your story. It's been a pleasure. And Thank you for all, what you're doing all the time, which has sort of opened the doors for me as well to, to come to terms with a lot of these issues. <laughs> so amazing. we pray for you and Lynn as well. And uh, the trust that Lynn gets back on her feet in, uh, yes. in all the right ways. Yes, thank you. Thank you. We're, we're uh, feeling much better with our freshly minted um, natural immunity as we wrap up our little COVID stint over here. So thank you so much, Errol. Okay, God bless.